Good. Oh, welcome to my session about uh, migrating your Spring Boot application to Java modules. Uh, but before uh, we get into the details, let's briefly introduce myself. My name is Jaap Komans. I live in Tilburg in the Netherlands, and I'm a, a Java developer. Uh, I've been doing Java since 2002 and professionally since 2006. And uh, when I'm not at work, uh, I'm also a husband and a father of two girls. And like you can see in the picture, I like playing board games, not just holding them for the picture, but actually playing them. Um, and I work for Group 9. Uh, we're a company of uh, experienced Java consultants uh, in the Netherlands. So, modules. Uh, they were introduced in uh, September 2017 with Java 9. And uh, let's see where we are right now with modules, because it's been a year and a half. So first of all, tool support. Well, pretty good. I'm working with uh, Maven personally, and Maven was ready on the get-go. Uh, the same applies to uh, most IDEs. Um, there's some stuff around Gradle. I'm not a Gradle user, but I've been told you can use modules with Gradle. There's no native support, apparently. But in general, tooling support is, uh, is good. But uh, frameworks and libraries out there, uh, the adoption is not yet really high. So on that level, we're not there yet. And even worse, adoption amongst developers like you and myself uh, is actually very low. I did a project with modules last year, and I've spoken many people about it, but none of them said, hey, yeah, I did that too. So um, what's holding us back? And last year, I attended a talk by Sander Mark, and he had a nice analogy. He said, modules, it's like your mummy forcing you to eat your veggies. These are my kids. You can tell by the looks of the, uh, their faces. They're not happy. And I agree with them. They're like me. They want more. Um, because I like my veggies. Uh, in this case, of course, modules. But why? Why do I like modules? And for that, I want to take you back in time a little bit to uh, uh, a year ago when I started at, uh, an assignment. And they had a legacy application over there, a big legacy application, 15 years development in, uh, 100 developers uh, have been involved over the time. And um, they had uh, an architecture picture for me on day one. And it resembled something like this. It wasn't exactly this, but it was nicely structured. Uh, they isolated the real legacy, the old stuff that wasn't structured at all, into a separate module, uh, same for the legacy framework and then started building a new structure uh, side by side, more structured, not my favorite type of architecture, but it works, there's some structure there. But as you might guess, 15 years of legacy, it wasn't like that. It was more like this. So there were more modules involved than uh, they formerly knew, and especially there were a lot more dependencies. And that was day one when I discovered that. And after a while of working there, I realized it was even worse. There were a lot of extra dependencies at runtime. Actually, there were uh, classes at the lowest level of the architecture doing lookups via reflection to the upper layers and creating cycles in the architecture. Um, as you can imagine, that was unmaintainable. It's, it's the first assignment I ever stopped uh, refactoring a piece of code after a week, because it was just plain impossible. So when we got the chance there to do something new, uh, we got a Spring Boot application on Java 8. I thought, well, apparently uh, there's an issue with maintaining your architecture. And I think modules can help me out here, because they will enforce the architecture even at runtime. So that's why I started with it. So uh, the demo I'll be showing you is, is based on what I did uh, uh, for that client. And, um, but before we go there, what challenges will we be facing 
uh, while migrating. Well, first of all, split packages. A split package is a package with the same name that's uh, exported by more than one module on your module path. And you might think, oh, well, that will not happen very soon. Uh, imagine a big framework split up over multiple jars, and uh, they have the same root package. And there's classes in that root package in different jars. You have a split package already. So that, that's one of the challenges you, uh, you might face. Next one is automatic modules. Automatic module is a non-modular jar file that's on a module path, and that's being interpreted like a module by the JVM. Um, they have some characteristics. For instance, they export and open for deep reflection all their packages. And also, they read all other modules. And up until here, that's not too bad. It's just the behavior you always got before modules. So it's a non-module jar, no problem. But the next one is a little more concerning because um, the module name of an automatic module is derived from the file name. And uh, version numbers are stripped off, some characters are uh, left out, so you end up with collisions. And if you think again, okay, that will not happen to me. Um, Robert Scholte from the Apache Maven Foundation did a little research and found 3,500 possible collisions in Maven Central. Some of these uh, won't hurt because uh, it's parent. You won't depend on parent. Uh, but the runner-up uh, name is library, which sounds like something you might depend upon. So if you have that on your module path, you're running into trouble. Uh, so better is to define an entry in your manifest file uh, with an automatic module name. It's like reserving the name of your module already, um, which helps users like me uh, by defining the module name and not uh, coming to nasty surprises when your non-modular uh, dependency becomes modular. But also, uh, it helps you defining a unique module name. And for unique module names, what you see right now in the community, most people uh, resort to uh, uh, reverse DNS, like we do with packages, uh, which is great. Creates really uh, unique module names. Okay, so we've covered the uh, theory. Let me briefly introduce to uh, the demo application what we'll be, be building. Uh, as I said, I like board games, so I thought, well, let's do a little demo with an application uh, around board games. It's a really simple application, has a REST API, and uh, you can put in some uh, information about board games. You can uh, retrieve it again through the API. And I also want to provide ratings, but because I have very little users, only one, me, uh, ratings isn't really uh, cool. Um, so I get them from an external source. That's Board Game Geek. For those of you who don't know, Board Game Geek is the biggest board game website uh, in the world. And every board game there ever was is on that site. And they expose an XML API. So I will be using that, of course, uh, for demo purposes. And so what you see here is the module graph I'm after. Uh, at the very bottom, the domain module, no dependencies whatsoever, just plain Java. And depending on that, you have the REST API module, of course, uh, with Spring MVC. Uh, there's the persistence module with uh, Spring, Mongo, uh, Spring Data Mongo. And uh, there's the Board Game Geek client uh, using JXB and OpenFane. And of course, I want my application to be secure. So I have a security module with uh, Spring Security and a JSON Web Token Library. And of course, to tie it all together, I have an application module, and that depends on Spring Boot, hence the title of the talk. Great. So, oh, yeah, sorry, forgot about one thing. Uh, I lied a little bit. It's not Mongo, it's actually Postgres. And what I did for my client was uh, I, I built the application with uh, DB2. But I thought, well, that's not sexy for my talk, so let's switch to Mongo. But sadly, uh, the Mongo client has a split package issue, which has been resolved over time. 
but only in the newer version, so not in the legacy Mongo client. And as it happens, Spring Data quite heavily relies on the legacy Mongo client. So I was kind of stuck there. So sorry for that. And so we're back at uh, Spring Data JPA. So let's have a brief look at the sources. Come on. Yeah, that's better. So what you see here, I have a little application. I already prepared my module structure. Uh, application module, board game geek client, domain, persistence, REST API, security. And, um, well, it's not too fancy. All. So in here, there's just two classes. Uh, my uh, actual application class and some spring configuration. Uh, there's nothing really uncommon in there. Um, so, before we dive into that, yes, let's get to our plan. So, step one. Step one is actually upgrading your dependencies. So before you actually start migrating, make sure that you're on the latest version of all your dependencies. There's of course many other reasons to do that, security, support, etc. But for migrating to modules, it's also a very good idea. Because as I said, the, the ecosystem isn't really ready yet. And over time, that will progress. So over time, you will get uh, modular releases of, uh, of your dependencies. So it's actually about uh, making the problem space of your migration smaller. It will really help you. Okay, second step, again, uh, reducing the problems, uh, problem space. If you're not yet on JDK 9 or higher, then uh, migrate to uh, runtime JDK 11 or 12. And that's just to overcome any issues that you might encounter there. It, well, not too big of a thing, but in my case, uh, using JAXB has been removed from Java 11. I had to find an external dependency, which is the, the RI from Sun. Which, oh, okay, got that working, but by doing that first, you eliminate the problem later on. Next up, of course, compiling with JDK 11 or higher. Uh, same reason, just making your problems smaller. And at the end, uh, it's a prerequisite to start with uh, modules, of course. Then step four, as you uh, could already see in my sources, uh, I already uh, prepared this, and that's uh, preparing your modular structure. Because uh, in many cases, like I did uh, in my project, um, there's no real modular structure in, in simple uh, Spring Boot applications, just one module. Uh, Maven module I'm, I'm talking about right now. And uh, what we did there is first migrate that to Java modules and then split it up later on. And by doing it that way around, we first created a huge problem for ourselves and then afterwards uh, chunked it down. And by reversing that, so first creating the structure you can do uh, your migration step by step. So that's actually what we're going to do here. So step five, and now we're getting to the beef of the story, is adding uh, module descriptors. And we're doing that bottom up. So we're starting at the domain module. Okay, let's see. So IntelliJ actually has proper support for that because when I click here, I can say, okay, create me a new module info. So uh, I need to give it a name. Like I said, I will be using reverse DNS. And then uh, this one has no dependencies at all. So that's quite easy. Um, but I know it's being used by a lot of parts of uh, my application. And there's two packages in there, 
that are required by the rest of my application, so I will need to export them. Okay. Okay, there we go. That's modular. Um, now, it's time to see if that compiles. So, I'm using Maven. Let's see what it does. Ooh, an error. Ah, that's too bad. So, uh, okay, you see all kind of stuff, uh, but the, the real reason is here, error records uh, in starting fork. Okay, so apparently, uh, I figured it out, this out uh, the first time around already, apparently there's a bug in Surefire uh, in relation with modules and uh, unit, uh, JUnit uh, Jupyter. So, we need to upgrade our dependency over there, our... Uh, Plugin. So, sorry. To a newer version. Uh, as you see, this is a milestone release, but it's fairly stable. Uh, the other thing you can do is just disable forking. That will work just as well. But uh, I thought this was a, this was a nice for a solution. So yes, please import changes. And now let's see if it does compile and run. And this time around, I'm using uh, IntelliJ to compile. OK, compilation succeeded, and it runs. So let's go to Postman. Uh, let's give you a brief uh, walkthrough of the application. Uh, first of all, I want to log in. So, getting a JSON web token here, Postman will uh, will pick up on that. And then what I can do is create a new board game. So, fill in some parameters. Getting the response, Postman will pick up on the ID, so I can now prove that it actually saved it. There's my board game again. And, as I said, I want to get my stats from Board Game Geek. Oh dear. Oh dear. Oh, that's the wrong uh, tab. Sorry. That's actually the Board Game Geek uh, uh, API itself. So you saw a little preview of that. So um, as you see here, I got myself an average from Board Game Geek. So everything is working. Uh, we're good. So let's back, head back here, and let's uh, head on with the next one, the security uh, module. So again here, create a new module info, and this time I prepared this a little bit. So as you can see, there's quite a lot of spring dependencies, and um, what you see too about them is they're not following uh, the reverse DNS naming, but they are uh, really uh, properly named uh, through the manifest file. So Spring took a decision there uh, that's different than many others will, but being Spring, I don't think that will really hurt. Um, but it, the, the names are well defined, so that really helps. And that's also why I split these two out because these are real automatic module names that uh, are derived from the file name. So it also depends on uh, the JSON web token uh, library and on the embedded Tomcat for the servlet API. Then there's uh, two packages in there that I need to export uh, for Spring. Cool. So let's head on to the next one. Board game e client. Oh, sorry for that. Uh, 
Okay, I was a little too ambitious over here. I won't need that until later. So again here, uh, defining uh, the module name. And this is the first time I have an internal module dependency. I already created a module out of my domain. Uh, so I can now uh, say here it requires that. Uh, it also requires GXB and uh, Fane. Again, Fane, uh, no uh, automatic module name. So it's based on the file name. And this one is uh, actually uh, quite nicely encapsulated. As you can see, there's a couple of packages in here, but uh, I actually only want to expose this factory that's being used by my Spring configuration to create a new uh, client class. Um, so that's the only one I'm exporting. The rest is, is hidden for the outside world, except for the XML API, uh, package which contains uh, the uh, JXB uh, classes for the for the XML API, of course, and I need to open that up for deep reflection uh, because uh, JXB requires that, so that's why that line is there. Okay, now let's have a look. Does it still compile and run? No, it doesn't. And there's a couple of errors here. Okay, so module not found, Java activation, okay. Uh, but I see a lot of these. Uh, reads uh, sun XML bind from both JXB core and JXB impl. That means I've got a split, uh, split package issue here. And uh, the reason for that is there is really a split package issue in uh, JXB 2.3. There is a solution for that, but 2.4 is not final yet. Um, but there is uh, a 2.4 in Maven Central that you can use. So uh, let's fix that. So there's a couple of dependencies here. And uh, let's see. Replace them by this one, okay? And now, heading back to the module descriptor, that's what that line was for. Uh, that's actually the proper module name of, uh, of that module, uh, which leads me to a little bit of a distraction. Maybe nice to show, uh, if I click here on this module name, I will go to, uh, the jar, so you can see in the manifest, there's no automatic module name here. And if you do that for a name module like this, a real module, I will go to the module descriptor. So uh, proper support from tooling here, and um, that's also uh, an easy way to figure out if you're dealing with an automatic module or not. So let's see if it compiles now. Yes, it does. Okay. And it runs. So let's prove everything still works. Okay. Uh, reset the database, so I need to create the game again and then get the rating because this was the board game geek client we we're doing. Still working, great. Back we go. So, next up, persistence. Again, here. I prepared it a little bit, and this is quite similar, of course, to what you saw previously. Uh, it depends on the domain module, uh, it depends on uh, Java persistence, on Spring Data JPA, and Spring Transaction. Exports its only package, and it also opens that package to both Spring Core and to Hibernate, because these uh, use reflection. Uh, uh, 
to, to make this work. And um, as you can see, I explicitly said only open for these modules. That means that any other module cannot do deep reflection on my module. That is a way to open up, but only just enough. Uh, so it reduces uh, potential problems that you might uh, not want. Then, let's see if it still runs. Okay, still does. Cool. So let's speed up a little and go to the REST API. And then module the scripter there. This is a really simple one, as you see, just depends on the main, requires Spring Web, and exports, uh, again, its only package because of uh, Spring requiring it. Okay. That's not too fancy. Uh, so we now covered all the uh, modules except for the application module. So, so we've covered step five. And um, step six is migrating your application module, the, the main jar. And the reason why this is a different step is because previously, I actually well, didn't really rely on the module system. Just for compilation, it did. But I'm not running a modular application yet. I will be doing that from uh, the point that I'm uh, migrating my application module. And uh, that means we're up for quite a bumpy ride. Because uh, right now, we will run into the runtime issues that we didn't run into before. So. Uh, me demoing that the application still worked was kind of a little bit of show because uh, it, it wasn't running uh, on a module path yet. Uh, after this step, it will. So let's see what we're into. Uh, so, first part, pretty easy. We've seen this. Create a new mod module descriptor, and again, I got this prepared. Um, what you see here, there's, uh, of course, uh, dependencies of all the modules that the application made up. And uh, there's a dependency on Spring Boot, Spring Boot article finger, Spring Beans, Spring Context, all to make Spring work. So uh, this way, I set up my, my architecture so that uh, Spring the framework is really on the outside of my, of my application, not on the uh, internals, making it possible to migrate or at least your, your application is not riddled with uh, Spring dependencies. So let's see how far we get with that. And Immediately, we bump into an issue. As you see, I forgot two things. And uh, you will get a proper uh, error message. So apparently, my application, uh, because there's a Spring configuration in there that injects it, depends on Entity Manager as well from Java Persistence. And of course, it also depends on the main, not directly, but indirectly. And um, we can solve that by adding these here, like this. And this is also how I came up with most part of the, of the uh, module descriptors, just running into uh, errors and then letting IntelliJ help me out here. Um, but I can also do something different for the domain module. I can also go to another module and say, OK, this requires domain, but I also use the classes in domain in my public API. This, I can say, requires transitive. So that will also solve uh, my issue. So right now, it uh, doesn't say so here, but via the persistence module, it now also uh, depends on domain. Of course, 
uh, it's best to add that uh, transitive uh, keyword to all uh, all the modules that transitively uh, depend on the uh, domain. So let's try again. Okay, different error. And this time, um, it's again a split package issue. So apparently my uh, JSON Web Token library uh, has a split package issue. And um, I was about to switch libraries, but then I found out that the package that it is complaining about only uh, has uh, two classes. So I thought, and these two classes are uh, Jackson serializers, deserializers. I can uh, just as well uh, migrate these two classes to myself and uh, solve it that way. So I prepared a little patch for that. Let's apply that. Okay. There's some more work uh, involved, so uh, I'll just show you uh, the result of that. So it's in my security module. Yes. And uh, what you can see here, uh, edit now a direct dependency on uh, Jackson for uh, serialization and deserialization. And I added the two classes and own implementation based on what's, what was in the library. So it's a little bit of a workaround. And but it's an easy way to solve it. Let's see what it does now. OK, it's booting. And not for long. OK, ah, too bad. But as you see, I get quite good error messages. It says, uh, my application module does not open uh, the, uh, the root package to Spring Core. OK. I can actually copy-paste that, more or less. So that's, uh, that's really useful. So uh, let's go there. There's just one word too much and one character to few. And uh, I know there's one more package in there. OK. Cool. Up to the next problem. And again here, uh, similar thing. Uh, my security package doesn't properly open uh, for deep reflection. So I'm going to do that. Oh, no, that's not the one. So we're getting there. One more time. Okay, getting a different uh, kind of error now. Uh, that's that's promising. Uh, new errors are always better than uh, existing errors. So. What I'm missing here, OK, class not found. Java SQL, SQL exception. So apparently, I also depend on Java SQL. So let's add that to the list. Uh, let's see. And I can also already tell that it also depends on by, by the, oh no, not here. OK, I was trying to save some time, sorry. Uh, let's see what the error actually says. Bye, buddy. But 
Oh, in the wrong module descriptor. Oh, sorry for that. So. Okay. I think we're through the uh, runtime errors now. Or at least during startup. Oh, no. Sorry, forgot about one. Oh, yeah. This is an interesting one. So, uh, Looking at the error, there's some CGLab involved, Spring is doing stuff, it's trying to instantiate the class without a constructor, difficult stuff. Um, so, uh, for that, we actually need to depend on one more module, and it's a dirty one. And this one really, uh, really cost me a little bit of time to figure out. I really had to go through the debugger, see what actually was happening. And uh, apparently there's some JDK internals being used that you're not supposed to use. Uh, so for that reason, I think the module name JDK unsupported is really cool. It's already a signal that says, okay, don't go here. But uh, we're there anyway, and this is the quickest way uh, to resolve it. And now at least we know that there's something uh, we need to resolve uh, towards the future. Okay, and we're up. First time it's really booting. So let's see if we can get it to log in. We can. Okay, no runtime issues there. Then can we make it to create a board game? Ooh. 4.15, unsupported media type. This is the other one that really threw me off. It took me ages to figure this out. Until I realized I have logs. And uh, couldn't find an answer anywhere on the entire interwebs. But my logs really said, okay, see, I'm missing something here. It doesn't open uh, the command uh, package in your domain to Jackson. And the reason for that is being used in my REST API. Uh, so, again, I can do some copy paste here. Uh, no, sorry, domain, wrong module. Let's strip some extra stuff. And there we go. Restart it. Okay, we're back up. Let's see if it works now. Yes, we're there. So, final test. Can we get the rating from Board Game Geek? Yes, we can. Okay, very cool. So uh, we got it sorted. We migrated our application to Java modules. Cool. But for those who really uh, read the abstract, they know there's more to come. Because uh, we're in gaming, so there's a bonus round. And the bonus round is Kotlin. Um, I was looking into Kotlin right about the same time I was working on this project with uh, modules. And the first question that came to mind for me was, can I do modules with Kotlin? Would be great. And the answer is, yes, you can. Uh, ever since version 1.3 of Kotlin, it supports uh, Java modules. And um, the way they do that, I think, is, uh, is pretty neat. They say, OK, the module descriptor, it's called module info to Java, but the content in there is pretty fine. Just keep the module in, uh, descriptor. And that also allows you to have a multi-language project with uh, Kotlin and Java uh, existing side by side in your project, which is very useful during migration, of course. And that's exactly uh, what I'm going to do. So back to the keyboard. And to prove that it really works, uh, I'm going into my domain module 
and picking the class that is at the core of my whole application. So if this works, I hope uh, it's a little trustworthy uh, for you. So here, IntelliJ will help me out. Okay, convert Java file to Kotlin file. There we go. Okay, adjust some stuff. Okay, this is a little dirty, so let's clean that up. Uh, get rid of that, get rid of that, get rid of that. My screen's frozen, oh. I have a nice Kotlin clause over here. Um, looking at technician. It's way less code over here than there. So, uh. And no. Shall I unplug? Ooh, <laughs> sorry, I work with my feet, so I won't do that again. I hope, I promise. Okay, as you can see, uh, as promised, there's way less code on the screen right now. So, uh, okay, Kotlin not configured. Well, please help me out. Java with Maven. Okay, just the domain uh, module. That's fine for me. Go work your magic. Okay, so uh, uh, add some dependencies to my POM and some configuration over here of which I know this isn't suitable for a uh, mixed language. So uh, need to fix that up. So this is better. Okay, so what did it do? Of course, uh, the POM file, but also in the module descriptor, you see here, now it requires Kotlin standard lib. And that might throw you off initially, okay, uh, all the requirements, but you have to realize that in Java, you implicitly depend on Java base. This is essentially the same, but it's not implicit, but explicit. So it makes sense. So that's all there is to using modules with Kotlin. Let's prove that it works. Okay, needs a little more time for Kotlin compilation. Okay, it's up. And now let's see. I can log in. Can I create a board game? I can. Okay. For those who don't trust me, I'll do this one as well. It's all working. So, we actually made the bonus round. Um, as I said, this is, this is all based on, on real experience I had in, uh, in one of my projects, and, and the ride was just as bumpy as I just showed you. I, I did that on purpose. I, I hope you don't mind me running all into all the errors, but that's what you'll be facing. Um, so to wrap up, um, things to remember. Go bottom up. Always go bottom up when migrating to modules because it really makes it easier and you can go step by step. So it will not be that big hurdle that you need to uh, jump over. You can go bottom up until you reach the application level without too much issues. and. You can do that sprint by sprint. Doesn't have to come all uh, all at once. Also, um, test all paths on every step you take, because the compiler errors are really nice. But you will run into runtime issues, as you saw. You will will run into them, and runtime issues you you won't notice if you don't use it. So test all your paths. Next, to remember, the logs have the answer. There's really good error output from the JVM. They end up in your logs. And uh, 
if I would have remembered that uh, preparing the demo, it would have saved me uh, a couple of hours. So don't do that. And again, uh, like I said, it, it still involves quite some pioneering. Uh, so if you like modules, yes, you can do it. If you're still a little scared, okay, stay scared, it's fine, but please, especially if you're building libraries, especially if you're publishing them to Maven Central, add an automatic module name. Please do that. That really helps the rest of us out who are going forward. Uh, with that, it's game over. Um, you can find uh, the code at GitHub. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, please come up to me or uh, ask them uh, via Twitter or email. Uh, I see I have four minutes left, so maybe if there's some questions here. Yes? Uh, yeah, question. Uh, thanks for the demo. That was awesome. Thank you. Okay, uh, the question is, what's my opinion about modularizing a microservice uh, which has a natural boundary anyway? Uh, good question. Uh, well, uh, I, I kind of hope to answer that question with my introduction talk. Um, for me, uh, in a situation where I'm uh, responsible for the architecture, I love it because it will uh, restrict people into doing things I don't want. And if they do things I don't want, I can see it in a module descriptor. It, it becomes pretty clear pretty easily. But then again, uh, is there a high need for it if you have a decent team with all professionals who do uh, write proper software? No, I don't think so. Not, not, not in microservices. Okay. Yes? Do I see any additional challenges in putting modules in different repositories? Um, not in particular. I can tell from experience at my client, we had uh, this uh, shared library that was shared across a lot of applications. That was a little bit of an issue because there were split packages in there and uh, the naming wasn't proper. So uh, I hope that's kind of where you're heading. What I did first there is resolve the split package issue by renaming packages and uh, adding automatic module names to, to just help myself. And the biggest downside of that was that I had to inform everyone, sorry, I broke your build, uh, or I will be breaking your build. Uh, so that, that's a challenge you might face, but that really depends on your environment. Any more questions? Yes, in the back. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, this, this I, I asked this, this question myself as well. It's, it's the common question when it's uh, about modules. Okay, there's a big overlap between uh, your POM file and your module descriptor. Can you automate that? And the real answer is you probably can kind of partially, but it's not one-on-one. -on -one. And also you don't really want that. But if, if you really want to have that discussion on, uh, on a detailed level, I saw Mark Reynolds walking about. He can tell you everything about it. Really, you know, really can have a proper discussion. You might be a little bit tired of the question, but <laughs> um, I did it myself. So um, yes, you can. You probably don't want to. Okay. <laughs> what happens if you legitimately need multiple versions of the same package? Uh, yeah, that's a challenge I didn't run into. Um, there's ways around that, but you have to be creative. Uh, sorry, I, I don't have real uh, experience with that. Uh, see, time's up. That was the last question. Uh, 
Thanks, and enjoy the rest of the conference.